Amen. What, what, I'm going to ask Laura to, to, I'm sorry, Laura, I, I want to go back to the, uh, the verse or the chorus of this song. Um, yeah, Lord, I need you that we just sang. I just think it's appropriate for the verses we're going to cover because one of the things we're going to cover in the verses that we're going to talk about today is um, do we really need God? Do we really need him? And, and, and if so, then why aren't we more passionate about learning about him? Why aren't we more passionate about uh, devoting our lives to his causes rather than our causes? Why are we more passionate to... We, we, we get passionate about a lot of things, and I'm not here to say that any of those things are wrong, right? We get passionate about movements that go on, right? And we're going to discuss that. But do we really need God? And I want to pose it this way. In my studying for the, for the sermon this week, um, uh, I came across a pastor, Alistair Begg. I don't know if you know him. He was giving an example, and I think it's really appropriate. And the question he asked is, is that there's uh, people who, um, who ask this question all the time, and that is, do orchestras, do orchestras need a conductor? Do they really need a conductor? Right? Some of you play in bell choirs, right? Uh, Kulan's going to sing in a, in a choir. This, she's practicing to sing with a choir. Do they really need a director? Do they really need a, someone in front of them keeping time and letting them go and then turning over? I, I, I'm not an orchestra person, but going over here and telling the, the flutes to bring it up. And, you know, I've seen them, right? And then they come over here and they do this and, and they're trying to tell the drummers to pick up the drums and, you know, let's pick up the speed. And then they bring the, the piano in. And the, they, do they really, do we, does, a, does an orchestra really need a conductor? See, because I, I, I venture to say, and I think his point, what he was trying to say was, oftentimes, we believers act like we don't need a conductor. Like we say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. But are we really talking to him every hour? Are we really taking the time when, when we have free time to, to go to him and say, hey, God, just checking in with you. You know, just checking in. I need some strength for my day. Because that's what, if I need something, then I'm going to go after it, right? I'm going to pursue it, right? When I get hungry, I need food, right? And what happens? I go and pursue the food, right? A, a conductor exists because he needs to, the orchestra, you have, you have professional musicians who are playing their instruments, who have practiced, hopefully, and who have done that. At, you know, even in our worship team, when we talk about, uh, when, we, when we've switched, rotated people out, which I'm so thankful for. I'm thankful for Kristen and Tony and all those that are filling in and are willing to do that um, because I think it's awesome that we can do that so that we don't, you know, overburden one, two, three people, right? It's great to be able to have people to step in, so I want to thank them publicly for that. But the thing is that do, even in our worship team practices, there have been times where in the past I've gotten sick or whatever, and then they come to practice, and they, I always hear the same. I ask different people, different members of the group, like, hey, how did practice go? Hey, Danny, how did practice go? Kristen, how did practice go? Uh, Kulan, how did practice go? You know, and, and I'll go along, and I'll just try to figure out how it went. And almost all of them said, well, we really needed somebody to lead us. Right? What, what's the saying? If you have more than one boss, you have no bosses? Right? If everybody's a boss, then you don't have any bosses, right? You don't have anybody in control. And, and, and I think that in a lot of ways, this idea of this conductor, this idea of this conductor, a lot of ways, by nature, we as just human beings, we reject the idea of submitting ourselves to someone else. Just naturally. Just naturally. So I want to leave that thought in with you because I believe that that is the framework from which Micah is talking, the prophet Micah is talking about. He's talking about a time in the, in the, in the history of the children of Israel where they are um, living the life because he's, he's talking to the people of God. He's not talking to outsiders. He is, if you read the whole text, he is talking to God's people. And he is saying, you have been living this way and you have been living in disobedience to God. You have been living, so to speak, without the conductor. As if you can do whatever you want in your life. Just because you are God's chosen people. Oftentimes, I think we've, we act the same way. We go around acting like, well, I'm already a Christian. I'm already saved, right? 
I've already accepted Jesus in my, in my heart as Savior, and now because I'm saved and I have the protection and the security of the believer, because I believe in the security of the believer, I hope you do too. But if you are truly saved, then there's nothing that can tear you from God. Nothing that can take you away, right? If you're truly saved, the question always becomes, are you truly saved, right? And that's a different message for another time. But the reality is, I believe Micah finds himself in this, in this, in this uh, I guess, this uh, time period in, in when he goes to talk to them about th that they are living a life without the conductor. Okay, so I want you to think about that and let that question resonate in your, in your mind today as we go into the message today. Are you living your life without the conductor? Do you really mean the words of, the, of that chorus? Because if you do, your life will look a certain way. Your life will look a certain way. Okay? And so I just want to kind of put that in the framework. What really matters to God? It's a title that I came up with today. What really matters to God? What really matters to God? We're, our, our text is going to be Micah 6, 8, where, we're, where I think we're going to end at. Uh, but I want to go through all of chapter 6. Uh, but let, let me start with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into some history about who Micah is, and we'll read that text, okay? Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time, and I thank you for this day. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the clarity of your word. And I thank you that you don't let us, you don't leave us to guess that you've given us all the answers in your word. I pray, Lord, for those of us that may live lives on our own, without the conductor. Those of us that seek you only when we find ourselves in trouble and in difficulty, not to live everyday life. Father, I, I ask, Lord, that you forgive us for that, and that you allow us to develop a heart that's passionate for you, that truly means I need you, Lord, and because I need you, I will seek you out on everything. God, I pray for this morning's message, Lord. I pray that you speak to um, all of us today, Lord, as we go into your word, as you have spoken to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Micah 6, 8. I hope you got it by now. The verse says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. Okay? But to do justice and to love mercy or kindness, your verses might say, and to walk humbly with your God. I almost have the whole verse memorized because we used to sing a song. When I was first getting into, into worship music, it was a song that just says, it's, it's exactly word for word. You know, it's exactly word for word. It's just, he has shown thee, oh man, right? What is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. You guys remember that song? Right? Philip probably remembers from when we used to sing that back in the days, right? And that's why I memorized that verse. But after studying it and reading it and reading it in its context, the meaning of some of that has changed for me. After reading in its context, I knew the verse, and I understood it, and to be honest with you, it sounds very simply, simple, right? To do justice, to love mercy or kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Wow, that's easy, right? Simple. But let's talk a little bit about Micah and who he is. The background of Micah. The prophet Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, meaning that they were alive at the same time. They had their ministries at the same time. He lived in a small village named Moresheth, not far from the city of Gath, which was destroyed by the Assyrians when they invaded Judah. Living in this village, Micah came into daily contact with the people who suffered most from the system of land tenure against which Isaiah protested. When Micah began his ministry, the northern kingdom still existed, and Micah's earliest messages were addressed to the people of Israel as well as to those living in Judah. Micah lived among the poor people and sympathized with them because of their hard lot. In many respects, his work was similar to the one of the prophet Amos, especially regarding what he said about social and economic conditions. Although little is 
Little, if anything, is new in his criticism of the ruling class. The manner in which he spoke caused his name to be remembered and honored among the prophets and teachers of later generations. No writer in the entire Old Testament has ever more, um, in, was ever more indignant than Micah over the ways which the rich and powerful use every opportunity to exploit the poor and the weak. Okay? Micah was a prophet who was speaking for the people. He had lived a hard life. He, he witnessed and probably felt the, the repercussions of oppression, right? And many, many people point to chapter 6 in Micah to discuss social justice issues that have come up. I know in the last several years, we've had several of them come up, you know. And, and unfortunately, social justice, the church should lead in justice issues, Right? We should lead the charge in those things. But unfortunately, we also get caught up in some of the you know, politics that exists in that, maybe some personal attachment to what it is that we're passionate about. We get caught up in all these things. And the reason the church fails in that is because they're not seeking God in doing that. And we'll get to the end of these verses, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I think there's a lot of Christians out there that are passionate about justice. I think there's a lot of people that are passionate about justice. I think there's a lot of people that are passionate about um, loving uh, mercy and kindness. They're passionate about being kind, you know. I think there's a lot of people that seek to walk humbly with God, okay. But I think that we fail at it because we do it from our strength and our perspective and not through the lens of God and his word. And that's why we struggle with it. Case in point, isn't it interesting when you, when you bring a group of kids together and you're going to discipline over an incident that happens and you ask all of them what happened, you get variations of different stories. And then when you go to administer discipline, uh, oftentimes you'll get a parent coming back and saying, well, I want to make sure that the other parents are going to discipline as harshly as I am. I can't. I can't assure that to you. God gave you your kid and no one else. So you're only responsible for your kid. You see what I'm saying? Because oftentimes we get, we get hung up in the feelings and the emotions and the desires for us. A uh, pastor talked about fairness a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week when he talked about fairness. And I think people think fairness means everybody gets an equal portion, right? And, and the reality is that that's not fairness. Fairness is you get what you need. Some people need a whole lot more than others, Right? For example, I'll give you a quick example. It's not in my notes, but I'll give you a quick example. If I were to have, if I was to be blessed with, I don't know, money. I was to be blessed with money, and I had a lot of money. And my son was of age, and he was old enough, and he was very successful in his life, and he was doing really well, and he, he was, you know, he was doing very good. And then let's say my daughter wasn't doing as well as he was, right? And I went to help them. I might give more to my daughter because that's what she needs more, Right? And I might give him less because he doesn't need it as much. That's fairness. But other people say, no, 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 you got to go 50-50. You give him this, you got to give him that. Every kid is different. If you're a parent, you know, right? Every kid requires different discipline plans. Every kid requires a different uh, a way that you communicate love to them. Every person, why? Because we're all individuals. We all have weaknesses and strengths. It's all different. And so when we talk about justice and we talk about these things, it's the same thing. We have to evenly distribute that through the lens of God, not be more passionate about one because I was affected by it or because this affects me and my family versus another thing. We'll get to that. That's kind of at the end. Um, maybe we should just conclude now and go home, right? No, I'm just kidding. Nah, I'm just kidding. Nobody stood up. Good. That's good. All right, so let's go ahead and do a quick summary of what Micah does. Chapters 1 through 4, the whole book, 1 through 4a, we see God accusing Israel. You'll see it up there on your thing. God accuses Israel of practices and injustice. I'm going to list you a couple of injustices that he talks about that's happening at that time. They practiced and tolerated false doctrine that led to a false understanding of the character of God. Okay, now when I, when I say these to you, I want you to think, is there a parallel to today in our times too? In the people of God. Right? Is there a parallel? Are there people that are practicing and tolerating false doctrines that lead to a false understanding of God? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Number two, there was injustice towards the lowly. There's injustice towards the lowly. Is that happening today? It's 
It's okay to shake your head. Yes, there is. Yes, it is. There's mistreatment of women and children. Does that happen today? Yeah. There was unjust business practices. Does that happen today? Yeah. You know, I find it interesting. I, I, I'm not a, like a, a real business person to, per se, but I find it interesting how, much, how many uh, Christian men I've run across that I talk to, or not so much ladies because I, I, I haven't had the opportunity to do that, but men who are businessmen and how they separate their faith when it comes to doing business. As if God's not a part of that part. It's interesting to me, even within the church. Number five, the exploitation of the poor, many of whom are, were rural dwellers like Micah, right? Do we exploit the poor? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There's a lot of people that, uh, I, I hate to say it, and I'm not trying to be political, but it's just a fact that part of the reasons why some of these cities are rushing and even secretly trying to provide for the homeless is because they're getting millions and millions of dollars for doing it. And you think they're going to use all that money for that? It's sad. That's the exploitation of the poor right there. Right? That's using some, some bad thing that's happening and trying to take advantage of it for your gain. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll sprinkle them some crumbs. We'll do something for them. It's just fact. And then number six, what was happening at that time was the government that lived in luxury off the hard work of its nation's people. Is that happening here today? Yeah, it's happening. That's what was going on in chapters 1 through 4, and that's what he was, God was accusing Israel of practicing injustices. Now, again, we're talking about the people of God. Okay? Chapters 4, um, the rest of 4 and, and 5, we see the hope and restoration under the Messianic king with the key verses being 2 through 5, and it says this, this but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for, one, for me, one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great, to the ends of the earth, he shall be their peace. Who's he talking about right there? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. And that's the hope that, that we receive is that Jesus is going to come one day. He's going to return and take his people back. That should be a hopeful event, not a scary event for us. I always tell people, if that's a scary event for you, then, then maybe you have too many things here that you want to hold on to. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying we have to sit around and Pray for it to come tomorrow, but, you know, when Jesus comes, that's a glorious day. There is no, oh, I, I didn't get to do my bucket list. Let me tell you, your bucket list is, doesn't compare to the things that are going to be in heaven. Amen? Amen. And so that's what's happening in chapters 4 through 5. Then we get to chapter 6 through 7, and we see God's mercy and redemption. Our focus will be on chapter 6 of Micah, and we find ourselves in chapter 6 in kind of a motif, okay? Kind of an image. Micah presents chapter 6 in the image of a courtroom, in the image of a courtroom, okay? In this courtroom, we see the judge is God. Who, who else can judge, right? I want God to be on the on the judgment seat, not some man who can make mistakes, who can go with his heart sometimes, even as well-being as it may be, can still make mistakes. God is the only one that's just. So he is the, God, he is the judge. God is the judge. Micah is sort of the prosecutor bringing forth the charges to Israel. And the defendant is Judah, the tribe of Judah, right? The nation of Judah. And the witnesses are the hills and the mountains. Okay, let's read chapter 6. It says, hear what the Lord says. Now, here we see the opening, the traditional opening that prophets have, right? Hear what the Lord says. It's a confirmation that this is not coming from me. This is coming from God. And I am his mouthpiece. I am speaking on behalf of God. Okay? I am speaking on behalf of God. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, 
Plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has, indict, has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. Funny thing is that last night um, I was watching A Few Good Men. How many of you guys have seen that movie, right? It's a court case, right? And I was watching and I was just watching how they're doing it. It just happened to come on. I was flipping it. I had just finished like fine-tuning my, my message, and I was flipping it, and I was like, oh, here's a court case. Let me take a look. And a lot of that word indictment, a lot of that stuff was on there, right? And, and um, the courts of law, you know, I believe we have the greatest uh, system in the world, however flawed it is, okay? I really do. But, but the courts of law only work if the people in place are, are, are really good people who are trying to be just, right? If you have crooked people, then you're in trouble, Okay, and so, so we have checks and balances and we have things that exist in our country to try to prevent some of those things from happening. But unfortunately, man is flawed and every once in a while we'll have some challenges there, right? And some differences of opinion. But here we see a lot of this word wording in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He is setting up the scene. Now, it's interesting that he says he's calling the, the hills and the land to be the witnesses. Why do you think? Why do you think? Because they've seen everything. They've seen everything come and go. They've seen how, how the people have, have, have responded to God's goodness. They've witnessed God's goodness to the people. You know, this, this creation around us, they, are, they can testify of everything that we've done. Now, that's if they could speak, right? But the reality is they can. You know how we often tell our kids, hey, I may not be watching, but God's watching. Right? It's the same concept, right? You know, I'm going to call the people who have witnessed from the beginning of time till now where we're at and have witnessed all the things that we're going to talk about. Okay? All the things that we're going to talk about. And so that's why he, he calls upon them to be witnesses. In verse 3, he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? This is the opening. This is, this is uh, Micah speaking on behalf of God, saying, What have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Respond, basically. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. He's recounting some events that have happened. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Verses 3 through 5, God brings about his overall charge. I'm sure he could have sat there and been like, you know, like this, right? Okay? But he's, he wasn't. God is saying, hey, what have I done to you? How have I treated you? But God brings this charge against the children of Israel and reminds them of, the, of his faithfulness to, to, to them. He reminds them of, of the Exodus event, right? The Exodus event is a salvation event. He saved the people from slavery. How often, brothers and sisters, do you, should you be reminded about how God took you from the muck and mire that you were in and brought you into salvation? Think about that. How often do you sit there and do that? Be honest. Remember that song, Lord, I Need You, right? How often do we do that? Let me turn off the volume here. How often do we do that? How often do we recognize that, Lord, I was dead, and, and because I accepted salvation, now I'm alive? How often do we do that when we're going to encounter things and do things that we know are wrong? Does that stop us from saying, man, I don't ever want to go back there again? Or is it so far in the past that we've forgotten about it and we take it lightly and we go ahead and do whatever it is that we know we shouldn't do? Think about that. That was a salvation event. The second thing is he reminds them that he brought leaders, that he brought them good leaders, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. He reminds them of the leadership of, of, of them being led by other 
people, their peers. And he reminds them that I provided these leaders for you. I provided Moses and Aaron and Miriam. I did that for you. Because obviously, they weren't being led by God directly. And so they needed peer leadership. And so he's saying, look, I provided them for you. I provided these leaders for you. How often has God provided leadership for you in your life, spiritual leadership, that you neglect to acknowledge or thank God for? I, 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 I am thankful. I want to say this ahead of time. I am so thankful for those that, that give to pastor appreciation. Okay? I know Pastor Lincoln is too. Okay? It's a blessing to read notes and things from people and, you know, get little goodies and stuff like that. And it's very, very, it feels very, very good. But my question is, and, and when we go to the district meeting in October, they always acknowledge the pastors. They always do something nice for us. And it's very, very nice. And I'm very, very appreciative. But I, I liken it to this, okay? What's more impactful? That I treat my wife randomly throughout the year with flowers and love or I just do it on Mother's Day. What's more impactful? What do you think means more? Throughout the year, right, Carla? Carla had no problem saying it. Ain't no shame in that, okay? Let's be honest. Throughout the year would be much better. Not just wait till Mother's Day and provide a gift. Flowers, that, I don't give my wife flowers no more because they all die. <laughs> so we gotta figure something else out. Cookies or donuts or something. Because she always tells me those are going to die in a week or whatever, right? And so, you know, but, but it would be better if we did it, like, all the time. We don't just love the mothers in our lives one day a year. We should love and appreciate them always. Right? Always. Our wives, do we just, do we just treat them very nice on, anniversary, on our anniversary? If that. Right? Some of us guys forget the anniversary date, right? You got to be smart like me. You got to get married on the last day of the year so you never forget. <laughs> right? Never forget. No, but I mean, like, do we just, do we just remember them on our anniversary Sunday and, and commemorate our, our wedding and our marriage? And, or do we, do we strive to be that every day? Every day. Do we commemorate our leaders that God has given us? Do we remember them? Do we pray for them? Do we thank them? Okay? Do we thank them? It convicted me because there have been several people in my life that played a huge part in my spiritual growth. And a lot of them have moved away, but I'm thankful that, I, that there was at least one that I was able to say thank you for your faithfulness to me. Who loved me unconditionally, I don't know for what, God put it upon their heart to do so, and I was able to say thank you. But I, I started thinking, what about the others? There are pastors who played an integral part in my formation and, and loving me and caring for me and encouraging me. Do I remember that? And do I thank God for them? And the last one of the rem reminders is in, of Balak. And if you don't know the story of Balak and Balaam, it's found in Numbers 22 through 24. Jot that down. You can read it later. I'm going to read you a summary of what actually happens in there, okay, because I try to summarize it to the best of my ability. So after meeting with uh, the story that he's talking about, after meeting with King Balak of Moab, Balaam prophesied over Israel four times. As he spoke God's word, he did not curse Israel, but he blessed them each time. Now, if you know anything about Balaam, he was the one that was going around cursing people, right? And he was the one with the donkey and all that other stuff, okay? If you know the story of the donkey that spoke, okay? But we're not going to go there. But anyways, um, uh, he, go, he went around uh, uh, cursing people, and he was known for that. And so when he was unsuccessful in cursing Israel, Balaam answered Balak on how to bring Israel under a curse. So basically, he says, hey, Balaam. These people, this, these people, God's people, they're, they're, they're inhabiting our land. They've just won a lot of victories. I need your help. I need you to go cast a curse on them, okay? Because they're too powerful for us. So I need you to go cast a curse. And so Balaam went, Balaam went four times because he was paid. Balaam was basically a mercenary. He was out there cursing people, right, a, a, in the Old Testament. And he went over to curse them, and he tried four times. And instead of cursing them, he blessed them, okay? He blessed them. The power of God, guys, the power of God, right? 
right? He does protect his people, and what people intend to harm us, God can turn into good, amen? So he, he, instead, he blessed them four times, and Balaam's like, guess what, dude? It ain't going to happen. I don't know what to do, but I got a plan. I got a plan. Let me tell you what his plan was. He said, you want to mess them up? He says this. Instead of trying to have a prophet curse them, the Moabites should lead them into fornication and idolatry. And thus, God would curse idolatrous and disobedient Israel. So Balak did just that, sending his young women into the camp of Israel to lead Israel into sexual immorality and idolatry. And because of their sin, God did curse Israel. He brought a plague of judgment upon Israel that killed 24,000 people. Think about that. Okay? I want to say this about this story. God is not in the business of cursing. That's not his goal. That's not his desire. Okay? That's not his goal. That's not his desire. Even though he did that, he didn't curse them because he didn't like them. He cursed them because he can't stand sin and disobedience. So God can't be convinced to curse people too. However, God does judge sin. And so what he's telling them is, look, God protected you from Balaam and Balak's little plan, and you messed yourself up because you could have said no. You could have said no anytime. But you messed yourself up. That was your choice. Man. You and I, we make choices all the time. And guess what? It doesn't matter if you're God's people or not. You will pay the consequences for your choices, for disobedience. We are never victims of an unjust God. Now, that's interesting because when you say that, that should be an amen. I'm thankful that I don't serve an unjust God. He is just, right? So if I am receiving punishment from him, guess what? I deserve it. Right? I try to, I, I'm, I'm not perfect in any means, and I try to explain that to, to, to people when I, I do have a responsibility sometimes to, to do discipline at the school and even with my own family. And sometimes I always try to tell them, hey, man, like, I don't want to do this, but you brought it upon yourself. This is a consequence of your choice. You see what I'm saying? It's just part of life. We have to learn to accept that there are consequences to our choices. Okay? And so I don't get any pleasure in that, in disciplining my family. I must. That's part of my job. That's part of my role. But you brought it upon yourself. I didn't seek out just to cast some punishment on you because it brings me joy. Right? This is a result of your choice, and your choice has consequences. And I'm sorry that these consequences hurt, but they have to hurt. The biggest one with young people is their cell phones. Right? When you take away their cell phone. But you told them ahead of time, hey, I don't want your cell phone to be used from this time to this time. Or you can have your cell phone, but pay attention. When I call you, I need you. And you're calling them for 30 minutes, and they're still not there because they're <laughs> on their cell phone. And then you take it away, and they act like you're doing something wrong to them, like you're being so unjust. And you're like, wait a minute. I gave you the parameters. You broke it. This is a choice you made. That's what he's saying there. The children of Israel have made choices. And because of these choices, there will be consequences. Verse 6, the people's response. Okay, the people's response. It says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You know what's happening here? You hear it all the time from kids. Man, I can't please you. There's nothing I can do that's right. Have you heard that, adults? Kids, have you said that? Yes, right? Man, if I clean my room, if I get straight A's, if I do this, if I do that, if I do this, I can't do nothing to please you. George Lopez used to say, I can't do nothing, right? He used to always say that kind of stuff, and people would laugh, right? It's true. 
They're playing the victim. They're saying, man, I, what? You want me to bring more burnt offerings? You want me, to, you want me to, 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 to give you oil, like rivers of oil? You want me to sacrifice my firstborn? Who are they referring to? Abraham, right? You want me to sacrifice my firstborn for you, God? What? What do you want from us? You are unreasonable. That's what he said. That's what they're saying. That's their response. Okay? Oftentimes, um, in, the, in the act of discipline, uh, the discipline for me sometimes goes on how the student responds or how the child responds to what I'm saying to them. If there's a level of understanding, then I don't think that there needs to be such a harsh discipline because they already understood what they did was wrong. But if they come at me like this, oh, it's suspensions, it's detentions. You need to learn. You obviously are acting like we're doing something wrong to you. No one's doing anything wrong to you. We're not being unjust. How often have you told that to God? What do you, now, I'm going to liken it to today, okay? So I, I'm going to draw a parallel here. And churches have this problem sometimes, too. But, like, God, what are you talking about? I can go to church on Sunday. You expect me to be there on time? I go. Right? Oh, what are you talking about, God? You expect me to give? I gave two bucks. I gave. Right? Oh, you, you expect me to give till it hurts? It's unreasonable. Oh, you expect me to watch what comes out of my mouth, God? That's unreasonable. You expect me to conduct myself different, even though I'm doing business, to follow Christian principles? It's unreasonable. Oh, God, you expect me to have the same demeanor that I have at church, that I have at work, that I have with my family, that I have at, at, at family get-togethers, that I have at the Starbucks? You expect me to be consistently the same? That's unreasonable. Oh, you don't, you, you, you expect me to, to worship you? You expect me to come and worship you? That's unreasonable. You expect me to attend a midweek Bible study? You're out of your mind. I'm busy. That's, that's what we do. In a lot of cases, that's what we do. You expect me to share the gospel? I'm not an evangelist. That's unreasonable. You expect me to study the word of God? That's unreasonable. God, I got a lot of homework this week. I've had a busy week. I've had to cook and clean for my family. I've had to provide for them the life that they're doing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my kids to ball games all the time. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm constantly busy, and you expect me to give you more? That's unreasonable. Now, I will say this, because I want to, to, to be honest with you. I think on the other side, on the other extreme, there are way too many people that, put, that think that the more they put on their plate, the more holy they are. Man, I'm doing five Bible studies this week. Man, I got five read-through-the-Bible things. I'm doing six devotionals. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm going to get to a, uh, an example that I want to give you. Because to be honest with you, that doesn't matter to God. So it's the both extremes, right? It's the people who feel God's unreasonable, and it's the people who think by filling their plate, they are doing, they are pleasing God, as if God's going to give them favor now because they're doing all those things. And that's why the message is tied what really matters. What really matters is not that you're doing all that stuff. It, what really matters is that you're doing the right stuff. Right? That you're doing the right stuff. It doesn't matter that you're doing stuff, that you're doing the right stuff. That you're doing the right stuff. We can almost hear Israel. This is, this is a commentary that I 
that I copy here. It says, we can almost hear Israel shouting at God from the witness stand. You ask too much, God. Nothing will satisfy you. If we brought thousands of rams, of rivers of oil, or even our first bone born, it would not be enough to please you. You are unreasonable. And I wrote right here my thing. How arrogant for us as children of God to claim that God demands too much of us. That's arrogance. Oh, another one that I thought of. You expect me to just love my wife only? You expect me to just love my husband only? Yes. You expect me to be married to them forever? <laughs> That's God's intention for marriage, yes. Okay? Yes. Forever is a long time, huh? <laughs> but yes. The answer is yes, and then it's not unreasonable. God says, hey, if you do these things, and if you do these things, you're going to experience your best life in those things. But if you want to go outside of those things, then you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. How arrogant for us to think that God demands too much. And yet they did. I find it interesting that often in biblical history, right, we see it also in, in Isaiah. I think we read it also in, um, in uh, we're going to read it in Malachi coming up. And we see it over and over and over that, that the acts of religion, what I mean by the acts of religion, communion, we'll, we'll talk about ours. We got communion. We've got coming to church. We got reading our Bible. We got praying. That the acts of religion, the traditions that we have, the mannerisms become what we believe earns favor from God. And in some cases, sadly to say, some people believe that's how they get saved. And that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. I wrote some things down. I wrote some things. Is that right? Wow, I'm moving pretty fast. I wrote some things down um, that I think are not to earn the, God's favor, but because we love him. Lord, I need you. That song, Lord, I need you. I want you. I desire you. I want to grow in you. Here's a couple, okay? Because I'll be honest with you. It's not like I'm getting any extra points from God if I tell you to read your Bible and you read your Bible. I tell you to read your Bible because the truth is that is where the truth is found. That is where life is found. That is where comfort is found. That is where instruction is found. That is where we find the character of God. That is how we know how to, how to handle things that come in life if we know what's in his word. But if we don't, then you, are, you have a gun with no bullets. That's the best way I can describe it. Your, your faith is empty and powerless. But that's something we should do, not to earn his favor, but because we love him and we desire him. When, I, when we say pray, it's not because, hey, if you pray, you're going to be elevated to this like, other level of, uh, of Christianity and, and holiness. It's because through prayer, you find communication with God. And you find answers from God. And again, you find more comfort. And you find more peace. Through prayer is the, the mechanism by which we communicate with God. So if you're not praying, then you're missing out on a big part of your faith. A big part of your relationship with God. You should do it because you want to, not because you're going to get favor. Now, there are some believers out there that teach different. They believe praying and reading your Bible, you're going to earn some sort of favor, some sort of extra power in you to be able to manifest God's things. That's not, that's not biblical. God says, pray because you love me. Tithing is another one. Serving him is another one. Gathering in his name is another one. Worship's another one. These things are things that should be done as fruit of someone who desires to be in relationship with God, not as someone who's trying to earn favor and check these things on a list. We should do it because, hey, man, I, I look forward to Sundays. I do. Because it's a moment where I can just solely focus on him for that moment. There are other parts in my, in my week that, I've, that I give to the Lord, but they all look different. But Sunday mornings is a time that I get to be with my church family. I get to focus on him for whatever concerted time it is, whether it's one hour, two hours, whatever time we're here, right? And then I get to feel blessed 
by the presence of my brothers and sisters, as well as the message and the word and the worship. It's because I love him, not because I'm seeking to get favor. A right understanding of this is to understand that there's nothing I can do to seek his favor. There's nothing I'm ever going to do that's going to ever get the favor of God. That he's God and he's just. And if he chooses to show me favor, it's not because of anything I did. I'm going I mean, to just be honest and transparent. I, I wrestled with that when my dad died. I thought to myself, hmm, it's, it's interesting. You know, my dad is serving faithfully, and the way you took him just seemed odd, God. Why? Why did that happen? Surely he could have been used for more years. Surely you had a place for him, even if it was just to encourage me. But I had to come to the realization that whatever my dad did in service to the Lord wasn't because he wanted to earn extra years of life. It wasn't because he wanted to earn supernatural favor from God. It was because he loved God. That's it. And he wanted to be obedient to God and his call. That's how we should be. I don't come to church because I'm going to get some bonus. I don't come to church because you guys are going to think of me better. Reputation. I don't come to church for the reason. I come to church because I love God. And this is where God's people are at. And this is where we can together come and encourage each other and get something from his word that, so that hopefully we can apply it to our lives. That's why we come. That's why we come. Now, I know I'm different. I always joke with people. I say, man, I, if, it, if it was up to me, we could start church at 7. But I know that's hard for some people. 7 o'clock. I barely went to bed at 6. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's hard for some people. I wake up early. So if it was up to me, I would, I would be happy with a 7 o'clock, a 6 o'clock service. I'm up early. I'd be happy with it. You know? But I know for some people it's hard to come and and get ready and come and be here by 1045. I find that weird. Let me, t let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. You have no problem going to work at 8 o'clock. You have no problem going to Disneyland and trying to get to be the first one at the line when it requires you to get there, right? You have no problem doing that. You have no problem, you know, uh, what else requires us to, to get early? If we're going to take a road trip, you have no problem getting up and getting on the road early. Right? We have no problem with those things. But yet, we can't get up by, and to church by 10.45? 10.30? Dude, that's my noon time already. Those of you that know me, right? That's my noon time. I'm already up. I've, you know, I've already had lunch. You know, everything. Right? So, but I'm different. I get it. That, that's something different. Now, if you had service at night, I'd struggle. Because I'm like 6 o'clock. I'm like falling asleep, right? But, you know, but it's, it's one of those things. But guess what? If, they ha if, if our church had service at 6 o'clock at night, guess what? My body will, will surrender to what God's will is. And if God's will is for me to be here at 6 o'clock at night, guess what? I will be here at 6 o'clock at night. And I will train my body and I will beat it down until it learns that you have to stay up on this day to go to church. Some people ask me because I've had dinner with them like, hey, can we go out to dinner? And we're out late, right? Been a couple of times, the most recent one, I've been out to dinner with Danny and his family, and we're all really late, right, where the restaurants are closing. And they're like, how do you do it, man? How are you still awake? And I'm like, brother, the Lord gives me strength, but tell you what, as soon as I hit the car, my wife drives, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. It's true. It's true because why? Because my body will not control me. If God has an appointment for me at that time, then I'm going to make that time. And so I want to say the same thing to you for those of you who struggle to be here by 1030. Okay? Okay? I'm, I'm being sarcastic. 1030. Okay? Those of you that struggle to get here by 1030, I'm going to tell you, you are in control of your body. And if God has an appointment for you at 1030, then you need to make every effort to submit, to put your body under submission your mind, too, because the mind tells you, oh, just a little more on that pillow, right? <laughs> the mind's the one that tells you, oh, hit the snooze button, right? Let me tell you, you're in control of that. And if God, if you're going to a church that has a service at 1030, oh, my goodness, then you should be here by 1030. 
should be here by 1015. Right? Amen. We should all say amen to that. Okay? So please, 1030? I don't, I, I always hear that, oh, it's hard for me to be there by 1030, Pastor. What? It's funny to me. But anyways, we do it because we love God. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Look what he says here. He says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than any sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. You know what he's saying here? I would much rather, I would much rather you live for me than to put a sticker of the fish on behind my car. That means nothing to me. I, I had a conversation this week. This is how God works. Young person comes, uh, sends me a text and says, Pastor, what does the Bible say about tattoos? I get it almost every year. Some young person wants to ask me about tattoos, right? And I share with them. I tell them, look, I'll be honest with you, okay? Because then I said, well, why are you asking? Why are you asking? Right? Because I want to know what their reasoning is for it. And then they send me a verse, the verse in Leviticus. And then I say, you know what? That verse is there. That's the, I'm glad you're reading the Bible. I'm glad you're reading the Bible. I said, but I'm going to be honest with you. It's a much more complicated than me telling you yes or no. The truth is this. The truth is that that Levitical passage was designed for the people under the old covenant, under the old thing. And the reason that was so important to God to put that in there was because tattoos and markings and those kind of things were used in pagan worship. They were used to identify with a foreign God. And God says, I don't want my people to look anything like that, so don't do it. Okay? So they're like, oh, so I shouldn't get one. And I said, well, let me finish. Okay, let me finish. I said, what kind of tattoo are you thinking? What if I get one of a cross or a verse? And I said, I said what for? Oh, because I want to just proclaim my Christianity. I said, well, tell you what. I want you to put it right here. I want you to put it right here if that's really what it's for. Oh, well, Pastor, I'm not going to put it on my forehead. Well, where are you going to put it at? Usually it's some obscure place, you know, over here where no one can see where you can cover it up. And I always tell them, look, if you're going to cover it up, then you already have your own answer. If you feel ashamed of that, then you have your own answer. God's not going to send you to hell for having a tattoo. But God doesn't care if you put a tattoo of the cross on you. On you. He doesn't care if you have a verse plastered on your face. You could have, I could go tomorrow and put tattoos all over my body. And they could be crosses and, you know, Israel, pray for Israel. They could be all these things that sound really holy. But God doesn't care about that if I'm living like the devil. That's what this, this whole intention is. God doesn't care about how much you come to church, how much you read your Bible, how much you put fishes on you, how much you proclaim Jesus on your Facebook or on your Twitter or on whatever social media you have. If you're living like the devil all the time. If you're living in disobedience to him, he can care less about all that. I said, so is, are you going to go to hell if you have a tattoo? No, because the Bible's clear. He looks to your heart. I said, I said, I'll never get one. Then I went to the practical side and I said, look, I just want to give you all the information. The truth is over 60 percent of people who get them later have remorse over them. And it costs twice as much to remove than it does to put on which is why people hide them. Because it's easier to buy a jacket that covers your, sleeve, your arms <laughs> if you're embarrassed of it, right? It's easy to do that, right? Let me tell you something. And I tell them, look, I'm just being honest with you. Like, to me, if I look at somebody that has tattoos, that doesn't say anything to me. But if I look at them and they have tattoos of Jesus and they're living in sinful life, then that's embarrassing to me. Because you're a walking billboard for Christ and yet you're living for the devil. And your actions and your lifestyle speak louder than those tattoos. Right? All it meant was you had the courage to go stick, stick yourself under a needle. Maybe shed a couple tears. Yeah. <laughs> right? And pay the money. Right? God prefers that you live for him. And I was proud of this student. They wrote me back and they said, thank you for the information. I'm not going to get one. See, because the truth is I can tell them don't. But if they don't understand and come to the conclusion themselves... Then, then they're going to eventually struggle with that later. And I didn't say anything. I said, okay, well, God bless you. Glad I could help. Right? Because a tattoo is a non-salvation issue. Okay, I just want to be clear and say that, because I know some of us out here got tattoos. 
okay? And I want to tell you right now, it's a non-salvation issue. But God doesn't care about those as much as he cares about how you're living your life. Right? Now, in the Old Testament, that Levitical passage, okay, it does exist. It does says do not put tattoo marks and scars on your, on your but it's, it was, if you're going to follow that, you got to follow the rest of the law. Yeah. Right? We ain't going to sign up for all of it. There's a lot of other things, right? And so, so I try to put it in perspective and help them understand that Jesus came, fulfilled that covenant, and we're no longer stuck to that law, right? And so we have to understand the biblical truth behind it, okay? And so I share that with you. I know that I'm not trying to offend anybody who may have one. Don't go out of church, you know, trying to hide your, you know, your tattoos, you know. You know Pastor, talk about tattoos. You know, I got to hide them. No, Right? I'm just saying it's not a salvation issue, but God doesn't care about all that stuff. God is not as interested in the formalities of sacrifices as he is in a loyalty and love for him. He does not want us to worship from obligation, but because we love him. Because we love him. That's why he wants us to, to worship him. Not because, oh, we got worship time right now. Oh, they're singing a song I like, so I'm going to sing. Oh, I don't like that song. Right? That's someone who does it out of obligation. Someone who does it because they love God. It doesn't matter what song is being sung. They're going to sing it. They're going to sing it. Okay? God, God worked on me in that. I'm going to confess to you real quick. God worked on me in that because there are songs that I like too and there are songs that I don't like. And there are songs I've never heard. We're, we're about to go to, a, I'm about to go to the state meeting. Um, with Laura, I think, right, up north in our Fremont church, and they always sit, pull out the hymnals, the hymn books. The old, the old ones, right? And I know a lot of them, right? But, man, they sing some songs that I've never heard. So I used to sit there saying, man, I'm not going to sing. I don't know this song, you know? And they sing songs that I've never heard all the time, and I'm like, wow. And then I'll pull a hymn, and they've never heard it because people have a different definition of what a hymn is. Okay? Trust me, I've had discussions over and over and over again. People will get mad if you sing the hymn in the wrong tempo. Oh, that's not the hymn. The hymn goes. It's the same words. That's a hymn. See, I qualify hymns, songs that were written in a certain period of time. Those are hymns. Okay? The lyrics. Contemporary artists try to take some of those and change it with contemporary music and put it on it. Some sound good, some don't. I'm going to lie to you. But it's still a hymn. And besides that, we shouldn't get an attitude if that's what we like or we don't like the songs that are being sung. As long as the songs that are being sung are biblical. Okay? I'm always looking at that when we're picking songs. I'm thinking, hmm... Is that true? Do we believe that? There's been songs where people where sound really cool and they, they're really, they have good lyrics, but they're just not biblical. So I try really hard to say I'm never, I, I can't say I'm never because sometimes I make mistakes too, but never try to sing those in church. Because it's just not true. Songs that have images that God does for us as long as because we're his people, because we have favor in him. It's not a biblical concept. God does for us because of his goodness and mercy. Not because I've earned it. I will never earn it. I will never earn it. Let's move on. My wife told me, I gave her my message in summary. She says, oh, that's great. That only, I think I said, it only took me like 10 minutes. And she's like, yeah, but you have the magical way of turning 10 minutes to like three hours. So... <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if she's saying I'm talk too much or, you know, God is bestowing some words of wisdom, you know. Uh, let's get on to verse, uh, verse 8, which is the verse that we want to go through, and I'll quickly go through this. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love mercy or kindness and to walk humbly with your God. What really matters? He is responding in this scene that we talked about, this courtroom, where they responded, it's too much for you, for you to do. In that particular context, he's saying, look, God has already told you what's good. Simple. Simple. And he breaks it down into three things. 
Three things. Doing justice, loving mercy and kindness, and walking humbly with our God. God is saying, you act as if I require of you some mystery. In fact, it's not a mystery at all. I have already shown you clearly what is good and what I require of you. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't have us looking for some mystery on how to please him? Aren't you thankful that as we can go to the Bible and we can read? It's all there already. He's not having us trying to decipher some mystical thing where we're wondering, am I really saved or not? Am I really going to go to heaven? Am I really a Christian? I'm thankful of that. God doesn't hide those expectations from us. He puts it all throughout his word. We don't have to guess what we have to do to please him. Aren't you glad about that? Here's the problem that we run into. We just don't want to do the things that he asks us to do. That's where the real problem comes in. We just don't want to. We have to own up to that. We just don't want to. Right? Doing justice is not about what we believe justice is. It is within the framework of what God believes justice is. Biblical justice is creating a situation in and society where everything is right, where the most vulnerable and weakest can flourish and thrive. Okay? I struggle with this sometimes when we went through some of the social justice times that we went through recently, prior to COVID. Maybe it was right after COVID, where we, where we were bombarded with, like, you know, I'm just going to say I'm not because I'm critical of any of them. I don't know enough about the organizations to speak intelligently about it, but like the Black Lives Matter and, you know, so on, and so, or the Me Too movement and things. I have no doubt that they have, there's credence in the fact that people mistreat people. I have no doubt about that, okay? Where I have a problem is that, that where if you're asking for justice as it pertains to, to any movement, why aren't we just as passionate about the unborn babies? Right? And I know that people try to come to some agreement and they try to say, well, all lives matter, right? And then they went through the police and, you know, supporting our service people. And we had this, this, this I believe it was an agenda, but, you know, it doesn't matter. We had this, this thing go through our society. And, and, and guess what? If you look at it through a biblical lens, yes, black lives do matter. Absolutely, they do. God doesn't see race. But then I had Asian friends that were like, Asian hate. Asian lives matter. And, you know, you have so on and so forth. And you can talk about any race out there. When you look at it through the biblical lens, God loves everyone. It's sad that we have to say that. That we have to remind people of that. And I recognize that some of it is because maybe you were passionate about the Asians because you're Asian. And it impacted you and it bothered you. Maybe you were impacted by the Me Too movement because you suffered with some injustice towards women. If you don't know what the Me Too movement was, it was when women were being abused and, and you know, taken advantage of by higher ups and, and people got sued and people went to jail and things like that, right? And, and it was an unjust thing. I have no doubt about that. I'm not trying to diminish that, right? All those movements, all those things, guess what? It's called sin in God's eyes. And God cares about all of it from the perspective of he detests all sin. Amen? Amen? And so I just, I, I want to say that because justice is not the problem of justice. If I ask somebody, is this just any scenario, I say, hey, I'm going to take three people here and I'm going to give you, tell you a story and then I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think is just in response to that story. The likelihood is that every person is going to respond differently. Because why? We approach justice from us, from our perspective, the things that I've gone through, the things that I deal with. So if you're talking, let's say we're talking about abortion, and you have somebody who, who went through one at a young age, you have somebody who's never experienced that in their life, and you have, you know, they're all going to have different feelings towards that, right? Because why? Because we approach it from man's heart to do justice. And what he's saying here, I want to be clear, what he's saying here is not that. He's saying, do justice from the heart of God. It looks different. It sounds different. The only way you're going to know what that is is you've got to read God's word. 
you got to know the character of God to do that. And if you don't know it, then you have no business telling people what justice is. Because you're just doing it from a selfish perspective, from what your heart believes. I don't have the answers. Right? People, it's funny, I guess because I'm Mexican, people say, what do you think about the immigration situation? My dad, was, my dad came illegally. So my, my, my response is going to be shaped by some of that. If I respond from my heart, but if I look at it from God's heart, and I look at Scripture and what God teaches about, about aliens and about us not being, you know, being foreigners in this land, and I, as hard as that may sound, that, that we have to approach that kind of justice from that perspective. I don't have the answers when it comes to policy, but I can tell you that as believers, there is biblical context for alien residency. How do we treat those people that are aliens? God calls you and I aliens in this world. I'm just throwing it out there. Justice from the Bible is different than justice from here. Remember in the Bible it said a hand, an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, right? Because that was, that, was, that was how God set up justice at that time. God didn't care who it was. He was like, hey, it's going to be equal. What you cause harm, it's got to be equal back. The punishment has to fit the crime. We hear that all the time, right? I think our justice system strives for that. They mess it up sometimes, but they strive for that. Okay? So we got to see justice from God's lens. Yes, do justice, but do it from a biblical perspective. Don't just do justice from your heart and your emotion and what you think is right and what your family suffered. Do justice from a biblical perspective. That's why I like the the thing that we're praying about. I, I, I challenge you again, pray about this. We may come to you as a church body, but you know, we've been asked to maybe participate in, in, um, in praying for and days where we go down and we pray over the people at the abortion clinic there. We're not yelling at them. We're not going to try to make them feel bad. We're just going to pray for them. That's biblical justice. I don't know what their circumstances are. It's not going to be loving for me to stand there and call them all kinds of names and tell them that they're going to hell and tell them this and make them feel worse than they already feel as they're walking in there than to say, hey, there's another way. God loves you. He loves that kid. And if you're interested or if you're not, let us pray for you. It's awesome. That's a biblical approach to justice. Not throwing rocks, not doing all God doesn't call us to do that kind of stuff. I have always told people, God never leads us to handle a situation through sin. In other words, he won't say, hey, you're going to go lie, cheat, and steal to accomplish this greater good over here. That's not biblical. Okay? So we can't get in that mindset. Do justice, but do it from God's heart, not from your own. Love, mercy, and kindness. This is a heart attitude. Not as a duty, but as a glad and spontaneous action. God's mercy and kindness is undeserved and comes in moments that we often don't expect. Okay? Can our heart reach a level of oneness with God that we can love mercy and kindness as he does? Some of us practice mercy and kindness, but we do it begrudgingly. Show them mercy. But if it was on Tuesday... All right? They caught me in a good mood. Nah. Let me tell you something. That's not loving mercy. Loving mercy is you can't wait to show someone mercy and kindness. You look for opportunities to do that because God gave it to you. Again, mercy and kindness, not from our heart, not from what we desire, from, but from God's heart. And we, our desire is to become one with his heart. And the last one, to walk humbly with God. Now, this is a big one, and I had a lot of stuff on this, and I'm just going to suffice to say this. Many Christians do not walk humbly with God. They walk with pride. I'm a Christian. And they look down on people who sin. And they act like they don't sin. That's not walking humbly with God. Walking humbly with God, simply put, is submitting yourself to his will. Submitting yourself to his will. 
Uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote this, and I really like it. He says, I would not advise any of you to try to be humble, but be humble. Oh, I'm going to try to be humble. Man, be humble. Become humble. Become humility. Right? Become humility as to acting humbly when a man forces himself to it. That is poor stuff. When a man talks a great deal about his humility, when he is very humble to everyone, he is generally a canting hypocrite. Humility must be in the heart, and then it will come out spontaneously as the overflow or the outflow of life in every act that a man performs. And I want to say something about humility because I run across this all the time. True humility is, not, is thinking rightly of yourself, not meanly of yourself. Some people like to think, oh, if I beat myself up, if I say that I'm this and I'm that and I'm trying to lower expectations of everybody, that's not what God intends. God doesn't say beat yourself up over that. He says look at yourself in the right light. Okay? That would be like me looking in the mirror and saying, oh, man, you know, it's so grotesque what I see. I can't believe, right? Well, I don't, God doesn't, that's not humility. Humility would be looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, Frank? You've come a long way in your physique. You've worked really hard, but you've still got a ways to go. So you could either keep working hard at your body, right? That's the right view of it, right? That's what he's asking when it comes to humility, submitting to his will, True, it's not being mean to yourself. When you have found out that you are re- what you really are, you will be humble, for you are nothing to boast of. To be humble will make you safe. To be humble will make you happy. To be humble will make you music in your heart when you go to bed. To be humble here will make you wake up in the likeness of your master by and by. That's Charles Spurgeon. Man, I love that. Let me tell you how that looks in the New Testament, Romans 12 too, right? The only way you're ever going to accomplish this is if you apply this every day, not conforming to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'm always amazed at Christians who are living in sin. They're, they're in trouble, and then all of a sudden they think they're deciphering God's They try to quote scripture. They try to do all this stuff. Man, you can't see it clearly. You're blinded by the sin. You're blinded until you transform your mind. Until you change it. I I shared with the kids in youth group recently, we were talking about about, um, our hearts. And we were talking about, we're in a series, again, I think I shared it last time. We're in a series that says things that sound biblical or Jesus never really said them. He never really taught them. And the first one was follow your heart. That sounds really nice and cool and and it brings butterflies to us. Follow your heart. Just follow your heart, sweetie. You'll be fine. Let me tell you, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart lies to you. It does. Jesus says, follow me. God, God doesn't desire for you to just kind of like like shine over Jesus and rinse it off with Jesus juice. You know what he wants? He wants you to have a transplant. He wants to completely take that sinful heart and take it out completely and put a new one that's designed after God. That's what he desires, a transplant. In the same way, he desires us to transform our minds, how we think, how we approach things, right? That's what he's saying in the Old Testament. That's where Paul took this from, this idea that, hey, you have to change how you think. Then you can perform true humility. Then you can be really humble. Then you can do justice as God designed. Then you can love mercy and kindness. I want to challenge you, and I'll close with this. You guys want to come up and get ready. I want to challenge you with this. Because it is challenging. It seems real simple and easy. But I want to be honest with you, it's not. Because there's a couple things that we struggle with when it comes to applying these three things. And they are this. The first one, we must never attempt to carry out these things through our lens, but through the lens of the gospel. The gospel is what's most important. Sharing Christ is more. Like I was telling that girl about the the cross. It's great that you have, if you want to get that, that's fine. That's up to you. Okay, that's between you and the Lord. Okay, but I'm here to tell you that God cares more about how you live than what you put on your body. It's the same thing. Okay? 
And so if we're going to try to carry out justice and humility and loving kindness and all that stuff, we got to do it through the lens of the gospel. Number two, and that's good news, that God loves his creation, right? Number two, we must not use this list to replace the gospel. There are some pastors out there that teach, hey, man, if you do justice and you love mercy and you walk humbly with God, that is the road to salvation. Let me tell you something that's not. Those are actual fruits of already being saved. Right? They don't lead you down that path. So we must reject the idea of replacing this list with the gospel. And I know some of you are list people. So those of you that like to just like check off things on a list, that's not how it works. We've got to change everything about us so that we live daily. And the last one, okay, the last one, we must understand that this is only possible by the gospel. Accomplishing this, ju doing justice, loving mercy, is only possible by the gospel. So I want to challenge you guys today. I know I was challenged by uh, reading this and doing that. I pray that you understand the verse better, and I pray that we do seek to do these things, but m above everything, that we seek to do them through the lens of God. Not through our own feelings and heart and emotion, but what does God's word say about these things? Because there are injustices that happen in this world. There are things that, that, are, that we do to each other as humans that are just out of what God designed for us. There are things that we do to each other all the time. Those things exist. I'm not trying to diminish any of those things. But if we don't approach them through the lens of God, then we're going to fall short of a godly result. That's the reality. You might get to a result, but it won't be a godly result. Because we approached it with our heart and mind and our desire. All right, let's sing the song as we close today.